This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman, with Nermeen Sheikh, as we turn now to the ongoing fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, where hundreds of soldiers, dozens of civilians have been killed since the conflict erupted on September 27th. The violence has continued, despite two attempts at a ceasefire brokered by Russia. On Wednesday, the Armenian prime minister said a diplomatic solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is no longer possible. We should realize that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, at least in this stage and starting from this stage, for a long time has no diplomatic solution. We should fight as long as it will be possible to find an acceptable diplomatic solution. The Azerbaijani president, that's Ilham Aliyev, said Tuesday his troops had made territorial gains in the region that Azerbaijan would regain Nagorno-Karabakh using force. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will meet with the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia on Friday. Nagorno-Karabakh lies inside Azerbaijan, but is controlled by ethnic Armenians. It was a site of a bloody conflict in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. This latest spike in conflict is the worst since the 90s, with new advanced weaponry. There are reports Azerbaijan is using combat drones purchased from Turkey and Israel. Amnesty International also reports Azerbaijan has used banned cluster bombs in civilian areas. Some fear a regional war is imminent, with Turkey openly supporting Azerbaijan, while Russia has a mutual defense pact with Armenia. Turkish-backed Syrian mercenaries are also reportedly fighting in the region. For more, we're joined by two guests. In California, Stefan Asturian is the director of the Armenian Studies Program at University of California, Berkeley, professor of the politics and history of the Caucasus in Armenia. His forthcoming book is titled At the Crossroads of the Armenian-Azerbaijani Conflict, History, Territory and Nationalisms. And in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, uh, we're joined by Rubina Mogosian. She is a writer, a photojournalist with the nonprofit news outlet EVN News, EVN Report, where she has been reporting from Nagorno-Karabakh. We welcome Welcome you both to Democracy Now! I want to start with the professor. To get context here, explain what was the um, trigger for this latest conflict, and explain the history of Armenia and Azerbaijan, and how um, this has ignited at this point. The origin of this problem goes back to 1921. Uh, this was the period when the former independent uh, republics of Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan had been uh, Sovietized, uh, and uh, Karabakh was inhabited by more than 90 percent uh, Armenians. Uh, the Caucasian Bureau of the Communist Party decided to uh, attach Karabakh to Armenia, and then on the night of uh, uh, the 4th to the 5th of July, that is, uh, almost the same day, Stalin came and uh, changed that decision for uh, political reasons. They were collaborating with the Kemalist Turks at that time. So this is the key moment. Now, why the conflict now? For a number of reasons, I believe. Azerbaijan probably thinks that it has reached the apex of its comparative advantage uh, in relation to Armenia. It has bought more than $10 billion in armaments uh, since uh, 2014. Uh, it has problems with all prices uh, and reserves. There is social crisis, so diverting the attention is a good thing. But uh, first and foremost, uh, the negotiations are, are at, a, at a deadlock. Uh, President Aliyev, uh, the, you know, is not even accepting a referendum uh, for Karabakh. Um, uh, he basically wants Karabakh itself, not the surrounding regions, to return to Azerbaijan. Uh, he made that statement just yesterday night, actually. I checked uh, the sites, Azerbaijani sites. As for the Armenian prime minister, he came to power in 2018 and inherited the negotiation process, uh, was accused of selling out Karabakh. Uh, and then he found out that actually his predecessors had agreed essentially uh, to what looks like a step-by-step -step, uh, process, whereby they are going to return five regions, then Azerbaijanis are going to open the borders, two other regions will be discussed, 
uh, probably one uh, very narrow internationalized linking Karabakh to Armenia. And then there would be a referendum of Karabakh people at an undetermined moment to decide what they want. Well, President Aliyev has just uh, rejected that in the past and just yesterday. Uh, and as a result, uh, Mr. Pashinyan has asked for a change of uh, that negotiation position. So we have essentially two totally uh, uh, divergent uh, views of the negotiations. And then there is the Turkish factor uh, of, uh, that has pushed um, this war forward, encouraged it, and uh, is leading it, actually. Uh, Turkey wants to have a foothold in the South Caucasus, to have a say there. Uh, and this is a key element uh, in the timing of this conflict. Uh, Rubina Margosian, you, of course, have been reporting from the region in Nagorno-Karabakh. Can you explain what the situation is there and also elaborate on what Professor Asturian said uh, about Turkey's involvement, the Armenian president just telling uh, the Financial Times that Turkey is creating another Syria in the Caucasus? Yes, uh, a little bit about the situation. I went to Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, on the first day when the start of fighting started. Um, that's uh, the 27th of September. And, uh, you know, if there's a conflict zone, this is one. Uh, you you enter into the capital, Stepanagert, and uh, the lights are off. The city is in complete darkness, and everyone is in bunkers and shelters. Uh, even though at the first uh, at first we didn't hear the bombs or the shelling or the artillery at work, but uh, we stayed there long enough to experience all of that. And. Uh, Oh, this uh, we often hear the so-called or Armenia's accusation or Armenia says that cluster bombs are being used and uh, it, drones are flying over Stepanagert. That uh, we have experienced that over and over again every day when we were in Stepanagert. Um, infrastructure has been hit. The city is without electricity right now. Uh, the communications were hit. The first day, there, so there was uh, a problem with the internet and communication. Uh, the city doesn't have gas, and I'm not talking about. I'm, uh, it's not only Stepanagar. The major cities in uh, nagorno karabakh Artsakh are in the same situation. So uh, this has started. This has been the case since the 27th. So uh, we have been reporting about this. We've been. Uh, you know, we've been on, on the ground. However, now here I ask the question as to why hasn't uh, anyone been responding to this? Why is it only journalists that's, that are there and our voices, as you may well know, often not uh, uh, very audible or um, may not, we might be considered as a side of the conflict? Uh, why aren't there other observers and fact-finding missions in, in Artsakh? to also report on the human crisis that's happening there. And uh, I also kind of want to talk about that we're, when we're talking about the conflict and we're talking about the negotiations uh, and the history, we are often forgetting that there are 150,000 people living there currently. We're, we're forgetting that we're talking about the fate of, the, uh, the fate of these people. And these are people who've been there uh, for generations. These are not new settlers. These are... These are the owners of the land. So uh, that's a bit about the situation in the uh, ground. I mean, I talked about the infrastructure, but the targeting of a cultural heritage site in, um, in Shushi twice in one day, and second time when there were uh, journalists there, international journalists, Russian journalists were hurt. Uh, targeting of journalists. Uh, we came to a point where we uh, decided to take off uh, the sign that says press from our car because uh, the Azerbaijani communication was that when journalists go to Artsakh, Nagor uh, well, they never use Artsakh, uh, nagorno karabakh that's basically Azerbaijan, and uh, they do not have permission from us to be there. Uh, therefore, they're fair targets. So, so far, journalists have been injured, local journalists, uh, French journalists, Russian journalists. Um, so this is what's happening. Uh, and uh, on this, uh, and the reporting is not equal from the other side. A lot of journalists, even internationals, the few that have been allowed there, 
uh, in have not had the freedom to report as we have. Um, I've seen, uh, to be more precise, hospitals, civilian hospitals, cultural sites, schools, um, buildings, uh, cities being bombed, infrastructure being bombed, and that's been going on since the 27th. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor Astudian, uh, could you say a little bit more uh, explicitly about Turkey's involvement in the conflict? Of course, there, there have been reports of Syrian mercenaries, uh, Turkey bringing in uh, uh, Syrian mercenaries to fight alongside Azerbaijan. Uh, but there have also been reports of Turkish officers and special forces being directly involved in the conflict. Uh, do you know of these reports? Is there confirmation of these reports? And if true, what are the implications of Turkish special forces being directly involved on the side of Azerbaijan? Uh, uh, very precise information, including locations, numbers, uh, uh, level of participation, and so on, uh, was leaked uh, to the uh, to the established reputable newspaper, Russian newspaper Commerçant. It is clear that this is coming from the uh, intelligence services of uh, Russia. It is estimated uh, that there are 600 uh, approximately military personnel, Turkish military personnel, uh, at, at the level of a battalion tactical group, 200, uh, instructors, 50, military advisors, 90 in Baku. Uh, 120 flight personnel at the Gabala uh, Air Base, 20 drones operators, and so on. I don't want to lose too much time, but uh, it's uh, very clear. And uh, the whole operation uh, was uh, uh, devised by uh, the, uh, the chief of staff of the land troops in uh, Turkey uh, and um, uh, Mr. Uh, General Umit Dundar and the Minister of Defense, Hulusi Akyar. So Turkey's participation is no, no secret at all. It's not a mysterious uh, uh, issue. Uh, and uh, they have been bringing in uh, essentially Islamist uh, uh, terrorists, formerly known as moderates in uh, some circles. Um, as early as uh, September the 28th, uh, about 1,500 of them uh, were brought in, and then more batches uh, of these people. The groups included uh, are uh, Failak Asham, Sultan Murad Brigade, Ferkat Hamza, Ferkat Suleiman Shah, uh, Jaish Al Sham, uh, and uh, a few others, uh, including now people uh, being brought from Libya. Uh, the key uh, um, organizer of these is a private military uh, contractor, a Turkish private military contractor uh, called uh, Sadat. Uh, the center for their activity is Afrin, and from Afrin they are transported to Shanle Urfa, formerly known as Urfa. Professor, Professor Margosian, we're, we're just about out of time, but I want to make sure that we get to the level of arms sales, tens of um, uh, millions of dollars, uh, tens of billions of dollars that um, uh, Armenia, uh, that Azerbaijan has bought weapons um, in the last 10 years. Where is it getting it from and the level of support from Turkey? And finally, in Washington, the foreign ministers of Azerbaijan and Armenia will meet with Pompeo to, uh, uh, on Friday, tomorrow, um, can you talk about what you want to see come out of this uh, and the significance of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as a petrol-rich region? Yes, I will address that very concisely. The arms were bought uh, mainly from Russia and Israel, uh, about uh, four billion or more from each. Uh, then Turkey, then a number of uh, smaller states, uh, for example, uh, Czechia, Ukraine, uh, Belarus. These are the sources. But the main ones are Israel, uh, Russia, uh, and then uh, Turkey. 
uh, the uh, amount of money spent exceeds uh, $10 billion. Uh, uh, that is uh, absolutely established. It might be a little bit more, I don't know. Regarding the meeting on uh, Friday with uh, Secretary Pompeo, he is already on record as saying that the agenda will be de-escalation and return to the negotiating uh, table, to the negotiation table. Uh, this is all fine, of course. Uh, the only issue that is left aside is uh, how come a NATO member, Turkey, uh, is involved in a war in which, of course, on the other side, uh, uh, there is uh, Russia. Uh, and nobody is talking about that. There is a kind of uh, free uh, electron doing whatever it wants, uh, and nobody is discussing that uh, issue. Uh, the stakes are uh, quite important, because, uh, for example, just yesterday, Azerbaijani troops have shelled uh, Iranian villages on the other side of the border, in Iran. Iran has already warned that, he, uh, you, you know, uh, it won't tolerate uh, these type of things.